Welcome back to Practical Stoicism. I'm your host, Tanner Campbell, and today I'm going to be interviewing a gentleman by the name of James Rahm. James is a professor of philosophy at Bard College. He's also the author of a number of books, all of which are quite fantastic, and which include, most recently, The Sacred Band, How to Give, An Ancient Guide to Giving and Receiving, How to Keep Your Cool, An Ancient Guide to Anger Management, Dying Every Day, Seneca at the Court of Nero, and most relevant to this conversation, How to Die, An Ancient Guide to the End of Life. This is a compilation of works from Seneca, and then it is edited, translated, and introduced and discussed by James. He has a new book coming out, which would have published just yesterday, in fact, if you're listening to this on the day of release. It's entitled How to Have a Life, An Ancient Guide to Using Our Time Wisely, Ancient Wisdom for modern readers. It comes in Kindle format and hardcover format, and I, of course, I'm a huge nerd, and I'm going to buy every hardcover I can possibly get my hands on because I, <laughs> that's just how I am, I guess. So I would encourage you to get the hardcover, but you can also get the Kindle, and sooner rather than later, there will be an audio version, an audio book version. And if that's your style, then there you go. I'm one of those people who buys the audiobook and listens to it and then buys the hardcover so that I have it in my library for quick reference. So I probably spend twice as much on books than I really should, but James Rahm's collection, all of his works are just really fantastic. Most of his works are related to ancient Greece and Greek life, but all of them are just, as I've said already, I, I hate to gush, I was actually very excited to talk to this guy. All of them are just really great, and I would encourage you to pick up as many as you can, all of them if you can, but definitely this most recent, How to Have a Life, An Ancient Guide to Using Our Time Wisely. And also, if you can manage it, spend the extra few dollars to get How to Keep Your Cool, because a lot of you have written in about you know anger management issues and how to keep it together when somebody upsets you, and I think it's just a terrific book specifically for that purpose. So be sure to check out all James's books. In the show notes of this episode, there's a link to his website and a few links to a few different of his books. And I'll trust you to, you know, check those out in your own good time. Our discussion focuses on death and dying. A lot of you have written to me after episodes to express, hey, you know, I get what you're saying and intellectually, academically, I can understand this. But when it comes to death, I mean, how do we overcome that? What do we do about that? I'm having a hard time with that specifically. And I think I've said before, I definitely say in this interview, that one of the things about Stoicism, or or really any philosophy, is that the advice does come across a little academic. Certainly it's still practical, but it's almost like a, hey, the way you don't be sad is you don't be sad. And that doesn't give you too much information about how to implement that. But I find in most philosophies that the wisdom may be in the words, but the execution of the wisdom relies on you normalizing the wisdom of the advice. So it's almost like waking up every morning and reminding yourself that this is the case. These are the things you should do. This is how you should think. And that's really how you learn to do anything. You habituate certain types of behavior, and then those behaviors just express themselves without you really trying. And when you've spent an entire life allowing your mind to kind of come up with its own way of behaving and you not trying to exert any power or control over it, you're not trying to develop discipline, habituating new ideas and behaviors is really difficult. So the key does in large part lie in repetition. Practice, 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 right? But James is, of course, a lot smarter than I am. He's written about death and dying on more than one occasion, and I think you're going to get a lot out of this discussion. So rather than waylay you any longer, we will just get started. Here is my discussion with James Rahm of Bard University. I hope you enjoy it. James, thank you so much for taking the time to be with me here today. Uh, You are a busy guy. You've got lots to do. You've got a number of books out, and you teach in a full-time capacity, so I appreciate you taking the time. Well, it's a pleasure. I enjoy talking about Seneca and Stoicism. Yeah, I would go so far as to say you are a proper scholar of Seneca. I don't know that I've ever met one before. Would you take that mantle? Well, actually, I spend most of my time on Greek things. Seneca is really the only Roman author that I have dealt with in any depth, but I do love Seneca. He's got so much richness and so much diversity in his corpus. He writes in every style and genre, so uh, he's really a, a wonderful study. Well, maybe let's start there. What is it about him that you like other than the things you just said? What drew you to him in the first place? What took you out of the Greek pantheon, as it were, and brought you over to Rome? 
Well, his life story is just incredibly compelling. The fact that while writing works of moral philosophy that we still read today and tragedies that are still performed today, he was also serving as chief minister to Emperor Nero at the height of the Roman Empire. He was literally the chief of staff for Nero's palace and had to supervise some of the nefarious goings on in that palace, as we know from Tacitus and and other historical sources. So uh, he lived a kind of double life both as a philosopher and as a politician with very questionable moral credentials. It's true that during the reign of Nero, I mean, at first he's a tutor, and then for some period of time before Nero is a teenager, Seneca is, in a way, he is the emperor for a small period, maybe five years or so, right? I wouldn't go so far as to say he's the emperor, but he is certainly the leading voice on policy, perhaps even the leading administrator of the empire. He wielded as much power as Nero or maybe even more. Something that I find interesting about him is that he's this great example of the Greek concept of a prokopton, a student of Stoicism who is forever a student. There are no sages in Stoicism that I've ever been aware of. And it seems like Seneca is very much this person who some people view him as living a double life, and some people view him maybe a little bit more graciously than that as a man who was really struggling with living a Stoic life. He had a, I don't know if thirst for power is appropriate, you'll tell me, but it does seem that he had a an obsession or a love of having influence and power and that he struggled with it. There's this duality of him where some people think he was this Machiavellian string-pulling puppeteer uh, who was just feigning being a, you know, a wise Stoic or philosopher. And then there's other people who say, well, that's not true. That's just what people who were in power wrote about him, you know, a hundred years after he died. That's a great question. It's really hard to know because what we mostly have is his own self-presentation in his writings. And of course, he tried to put a positive spin on his own career and his own moral thought. So we get a biased view. But he does seem to have struggled and he did try to exit the palace when things got really bad. He tried to buy his way out of, of serving Nero by offering to hand over his estate, which was vast in exchange for a peaceful retirement. Uh, Nero didn't permit that, but ultimately he collaborated. And so I think one has to come up with a mixed judgment about his political career. He didn't do too badly considering he was in a very difficult place, but at the same time, he had gotten himself to that place to begin with. Seneca's got this really, I think a lot of people might call it macabre or dark and maybe even an obsession with death rather than a preoccupation or fascination with it. I find it interesting, and I think we're going to get into the start of his life and his childhood just right now, but but before that, I find it interesting that a guy who wrote so frequently on death would have struggled in the way that you just described, because it seems as though the thing he would have been struggling with with, was with a loss of his life. Because if he had just left, right, he would have been killed by Emperor Nero, and eventually he was forced to commit suicide by Emperor Nero. Emperor Nero in the end. So I find it interesting that the thing that he expounds most on, I mean, other than ethics, is how to die well, how one should not fear death. And it seems as though perhaps the core motivation for him struggling in the ways that we that you just talked about was that maybe he was quite afraid of death. Well, there's no doubt that he was. I mean, we all are at some level. He made a principal point of his philosophic system to practice for death to rehearse for it as though it's your grandest test as a moral soul is how you meet death. And uh, he even described life as a journey toward death, that all our lives were learning how to die. That's a rather grim view in some people's eyes, but at the same time, he would regard it as a path to true happiness because if you're prepared for death, then you never have to fear it. Uh, It doesn't cause you any uh, emotional grief. What do we know about his childhood? We know he had a malady of some kind. Yes, he was um, either tubercular or had some sort of chronic respiratory condition. So he describes attacks that left him so short of breath that he thought he was dying. Those are part of his rehearsal for death, that in those moments, he felt like he was getting used to the idea of dying. He says that as a teenager, he even contemplated suicide because of the pain that his disease caused him. We don't know if that's true. I find it rather hard to believe myself, but that's 
what he reports of himself. And how does he go from sickly child to returning tutor to now a child emperor, not quite a child emperor, but before he became emperor? How does he become, how does he go from sick kid to the guy that is desired to tutor the next emperor? I mean, what's the in-between there? How did he become Seneca? So he um, entered the Senate in his 30s under Caligula, and we don't know anything about what led to that decision. That was clearly a choice to be a part of the political world, which not many philosophers would choose to do. He was exiled from Rome under Claudius, the successor to Caligula, and he spent most of uh, his 40s on the island of Corsica, banished from Rome for uh, what was probably a trumped-up charge of adultery with one of the emperor's um, sisters. So, um, during that time, he's still writing and publishing and getting a reputation for moral wisdom and also trying his best to get back into the good graces of the emperor in order to get recalled. And finally, in 48 AD, when Claudius is married to Agrippina, the mother of Nero, he's recalled to Rome in order to serve as Nero's tutor. As far as his rehearsal for death, what is that? Because he talks about that in a lot of his letters, he talks about dying in a lot of his letters. So what is his stance on, he talks a lot about dying well. What does he mean by that? And what do the rehearsals for death have to do with it? Well, rehearsing for death is like preparing oneself for any kind of trial. You have to get mentally prepared for what's coming. You have to be accepting and stave off feelings of fear or dismay and try to welcome your experience. His great exemplar was Socrates, who, according to Plato in the dialogue Phaedo, met his death with total serenity. He had to drink hemlock at the behest of the Athenian state, so it was a forced suicide. But even as the hemlock was taking effect, he discoursed cheerfully with his comrades, with his followers, and then finally said, we owe a sacrifice to the god Asclepius. Would you pay the debt, the god of healing? In other words, his death was seen as a healing from his mortal condition. So that, for Seneca, was the great model of how to meet death for a philosopher. This seems like something that anybody today is really going to struggle with. I know that a lot of my listeners have written in about how Stoicism can help them not fear the end. Uh, not that they feel themselves that they're near the end, but they know it's going to happen. And one of the things that, again, my listeners struggle with is the idea that, well, if it's all going to end anyway, maybe things don't matter. And that's a separate discussion. But how does someone of modern sensibilities look at these really, they're really strict ideas from Seneca? Essentially, he's saying, don't be afraid of death because of this reason and this reason and this reason. And he reasons it in a very logical, almost cold calculating kind of way. How does a person of modern sensibility buy into that? How, how can they look at death and, and actually functionally become not afraid of it or prepared for it and be as Socrates was? So I think you have to distinguish our ideas about um, suicide in the modern world and the general pattern of suicide, that it's a, it results from an anguished emotional state, a sense of despair. For Seneca, that wasn't true. Deaths like Socrates or his own death, which we can talk about, were what we call today rational suicide. That is, choices made with calmness of mind, with the rational calculation that going on in life would be worse than exiting life. So I don't want any of your listeners to get the idea that Seneca endorses suicide. He endorses a very specific kind of suicide, which is rarely seen today. As far as his um, ideas about death generally, he's focused on the quality of life that one gets from being prepared for death. It's, it's not a morbid philosophy at all. It's not as if we're all supposed to be you know, devoted to death in some goth kind of way. We're more able to enjoy life and to feel fully alive if we're not afraid of death or estranged from death, if we see that as a, just another rite of passage. So it's about living fully more than it is about dying. And how would Seneca have viewed living fully? Well, I talk about this in my uh, latest translation from Seneca, which is just coming out next week. It's called How to Have a Life, An Ancient Guide to Using Our Time Well. And it's a translation of Seneca's essay, 
De Brevitate Vitae, which translates on the shortness of life. So Seneca's thesis there is that our lives aren't short, but we make them that way because we squandered so much of our time that we regard time as a kind of infinite resource. So we waste a lot of it watching TV in modern terms or noodling around on the internet or just doing nothing. That if we were really aware of death, that our time is limited, we would not treat time as a, as a disposable quantity. We would use it fully and we would live fully. So that's really the core of his thinking about death, that being aware of it as the terminus, that we have a very finite amount of time, makes you more able to, to live fully. But in that view, doesn't wouldn't it be true that anyone who realized that there was a limited amount of time that we could go at any time and no one chooses when in most cases, wouldn't it be true that that would increase anxiety and fear of death because it would give you this ticking time bomb kind of feeling more than it would help to assuage it? That's not his view. That is an understandable view. Um, and there's an ancient myth that we were all, as human beings, we were deprived of the knowledge of when we would die because if we had that knowledge, we would always be anticipating. It's not Seneca's view that we should always be anticipating. It's simply that we tend to regard time as infinite, so then we don't make good use of it. If, if you had a certain amount of money, and he makes the analogy very explicit between time and money, if you had a certain amount of money, you would know that you had to use it wisely and using it wisely would make it go farther. Uh, you could be very rich with a modest amount if you use it well versus someone who has a fortune but squanders it and then ends up poor. So it's the same with time. Whereas with money, we might know how much we have. With time, we don't know how much we have. But if we are more intentional with it, if we're more careful with it, then we can make more out of it and perhaps make it feel longer. I mean, you are a PhD holder, is that correct? Yes. So then certainly going for your PhD doesn't feel very quick. <laughs> that probably right. felt like it took forever. That's right. Uh, and maybe some of my listeners feel like they don't have time to get things done, but maybe they feel that way because they're not trying to get anything done. Does that ring true? Well, so for a young person, um, Seneca would say, it seems like death is immeasurably far off and not something that you have to think about. And therefore, time gets wasted. If you, if you have that, that uh, illusion that time is infinite, that's when it gets wasted. So realize that your time is limited, that it's a finite resource, and that it's very valuable. You can't let anybody steal it from you. If somebody stole some money from you or some property, you would be outraged. But people steal time from you all the time, asking you to do things or imposing on you or wasting your time with meaningless chatter. Those are thieves just as much as the people who stole your property. You have to safeguard your time. So that's the message of how to have a life. It's about living fully in the moment and realizing that death is inevitable and will end your time. What anxieties do you think, other than, of course, the anxiety related directly to death, might be resolved by no longer fearing death? What happens to someone while they're living if they are able to solve their fear of death? Well, Seneca lived at a time when people in his class, the senatorial class, the political elite, were often in danger for their lives. So for him, removing fear of death had a very tangible benefit that we perhaps don't feel as keenly, that it enabled you to choose to do the right thing. You don't have to be afraid. Maybe the emperor will have you arrested and executed, but so what, <laughs> right? That shouldn't prevent you from speaking your mind or from taking the right action. It's the very quality that we see so lacking today in political leaders who don't want to lose their positions of power, and therefore they're willing to say and do all kinds of complicit and, and dishonest things and to avoid speaking their mind when they see wrongs being committed. So, you know, fear of unemployment <laughs> maybe is, is a best correlate to uh, what was fear of death for Seneca's class. Well, that's interesting. Bravery. I think that we see in young people today maybe more bravery than we have in previous generations, at least socially speaking. It does seem as though young people are more willing to step 
quote unquote out of line with what social expectation of them is. Would you agree with that? I think that is true. And I think that's a very healthy trend. Uh, I teach here at Bard College, which is a very um, iconoclastic institution. We have students who, who come here because they don't toe the line or they don't go along with social norms very readily. And uh, yes, there's a lot of bravery in that and, and a lot to admire. I hope that it leads to a better society when that generation comes to to leadership roles because the leaders we have now are sorely lacking in courage. It's very, very distressing. Other than courageousness, what else might be a benefit? All kinds of um, peace of mind about the afterlife. I don't know how pressing this is for, for us today because notions of heaven and hell and uh, you know, punishment in the afterlife are maybe not as prevalent as they once were, but still there is a fear among many of us as to what will happen after death. And Seneca tries his best to assure us that nothing will matter. Uh, we will either dissolve into atoms or perhaps there will be some kind of afterlife, but not the kind that's imagined by the poets with, you know, torments of the underworld. And that uh, non-existence is not disturbing. We weren't in existence before our birth and we didn't care. Right. <laughs> or that there was nothing wrong with non existence before birth. And so there'll be nothing wrong with non existence after death. I think Marcus Aurelius said something fairly similar to that in that look, if if there's death, it's either eternal rest or there's something else, but there are gods there as well. There's logic there as well. So it's a continuation of what you already know and how you already know the world to be and life and existence to be, or it's nothing. And, and why would you be afraid of either one of those things? What do you think about lack of fear of death in improving relationships, creating healthier friendships, relationships with your family, loved ones? Do you think there's a benefit there? Yes, I do. If I you don't mind my speaking personally, I just lost my father last week. He was 90 and he was ready to go. So it's not a trauma. But um, my conversations with him in the last year or so, when he was obviously aware of the approach of death, were uh, extremely warm and gratifying because he was willing to talk about his feelings about dying. He uh, even talked about how he wanted his funeral to go. So, I mean, in a family, there's always older people who are nearing death, or most families anyway, uh, grandparents for most of your listeners. And uh, the tendency is not to deal with that reality, to push it aside. But it's like the great, you know, 800 pound gorilla sitting in the room. It's, it's there. And if it goes unacknowledged, then there's a lack of honesty, I guess, a lack of communication. So our culture tends to banish those kinds of conversations. It doesn't like people acknowledging the approach of death. But for mo most families, that's a reality. What do you think the damage of that is? We're, we're talking about death. What do you think the damage of not being accepting of it, not being willing to talk about it, of it being a social faux pas? What do you think the downsides of that are? Well, I think the more we avoid it, the harder it gets to broach the subject or to deal with the realities of death. Most people die in hospice, in an institution like a hospital, where the family is next of kin or spared the sight of, you know, the messiness of death. And there's cleanliness about it, a, a, you know, antiseptic screen that's put up around it. So, you know, in most traditional cultures or in ancient cultures, that was not true. You attended the dying person, you washed their body, you prepared them for burial. Uh, it, it was a much more intimate um, relationship. My wife, when her mother died, uh, wanted to be near her body, wanted to actually, you know, get in the bed with the corpse uh, before they took it away to uh, to be prepared for her burial. And I think there's something very healthy about that. As kind of a final embrace or the last opportunity to be close. Exactly. And, and that is something that even as you said that, I, I kind of, I recoiled a bit. I thought, oh, how weird. But it, But it's <laughs> not, is it? But I think people think it is. No, she found it very comforting. And I, I actually missed the opportunity to see or touch my father's 
corpse. It was already at the funeral home before I arrived, and uh, there was a closed casket funeral, so there was no chance to even see him as a as a corpse. And um, I regret that. I think it's very healthy to have contact with the physical remains of a loved one who's died. It, um, as you say, it's a kind of closeness. What do you think the difference is between, and I'm not at all attempting to equate these two things, but I guess in a roundabout way I'm going to, if my dog passed away, he's about 12 years old. Now that could happen any day. I know that if I woke up in the morning and and found him no longer with us, I would pick him up and I would hold him close. I would absolutely do that. But there is, why do you think that I had that that recoil? Why do you think I felt that way when you told me that? Why would most people feel, oh, you got, got into the bed with your dead mother? That's very weird. Why is that different? Well, I think we tend to monstrify the human body, the the dead body, you know, it's associated with zombies or with uh, the undead or with, uh, you know, we're coming up on Halloween. So graveyards are very spooky and mysterious places. So uh, I think there's just a fear of contact with death that makes us shrink from corpses. But that's unique to our culture or to our time it is generally not been true in the great course of human history the most traumatic for for the living is when someone dies suddenly when we have no preparation and that's exactly why seneca told us to rehearse because you never know when you know a car accident or a, some horrible misfortune might uh, bring death into your life And if you're not prepared, it's going to be a much more dramatic event. So we are going to take a really quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about some of those ways to practice and imagine death so as to prepare yourself for it. Stay with us. I'm back with James Rom talking about death and dying and dying well. James, I think the next thing we should jump into is Seneca's own death. It was quite a story. Yes, it was. And it's told in some detail by Tacitus who wrote about uh, 30 years later than Seneca, but remembered it from his own time, from his childhood. So we were talking earlier about Seneca's role at the court of Nero, how he served as chief minister, was Nero's surrogate father in many ways. But Nero gradually got sick and tired of Seneca and gravitated to other advisors who he was more simpatico with. And Seneca got more and more isolated, tried to retire, tried to buy his way out of service to Nero, but failed. And finally was implicated in a conspiracy on Nero's life. Whether he was actually part of the conspiracy is not clear, but there was some ambiguous evidence that tied him to it. So his villa was surrounded by soldiers and an order came from Nero that he had to take his own life or else he would be executed. So he proceeded to commit a forced suicide much in the manner of Socrates. He started off by slitting his veins, which was a standard Roman means of killing oneself. But for some reason, that didn't work. And Seneca, uh, I'm sorry, Tacitus makes the point that he was so thin and uh, emaciated from having eaten a, a very meager diet out of fear of being poisoned, that his blood was just not flowing uh, fast enough. So then he resorted to hemlock, which was the same poison that had killed Socrates. He had evidently stored some of this up and in anticipation that he might need it, and he drank it, but that didn't work either. His wife, meanwhile, is trying to commit suicide along with him, uh, wanting to share his death. And so the two of them are both bleeding and, you know, trying to finish themselves off, but failing. And finally, Seneca dragged himself into a hot vapor-filled room and suffocated himself in the steam. So it was a three-part suicide over, I don't know, several hours. His wife did not die. Nero ordered her wounds to be bound up uh, so that she would live and he wouldn't be blamed for her death. And uh, Seneca's last uh, hours were spent dictating yet another moral treatise. We don't know what that was, or we don't have what what he wrote in his last hours, but um, he was philosophizing right up to the end. So it's an interesting study of a kind of semi-comical 
suicide because it took so long and, and required three different methods, but also one which shows the determination and the bravery in the face of pain because apparently he was suffering quite a bit from the, from the wounds he'd inflicted, but um, saw it through to the end. There is a dark comedy aspect of that, right? He spent his whole life learning how to, or training, how to die well, and then what a botched series of efforts. Yes. And the fact that he failed to use the same method as Socrates is very telling, that he wanted to go like Socrates, but couldn't quite manage it. That sort of sums up his whole philosophic career. He idolized Socrates, yet never lived up to that ideal. I want to go back to the idea of practicing for death, rehearsing for it. What are some ways that my listeners can rehearse for death? And of course, we, we want to be careful here because we're certainly not advocating any kind of actual damage to oneself. Uh, but how can someone approach hopefully dying better <laughs> than, than Seneca wound up dying? Yes. So um, right up until recent times, up until the 19th century, people in European society or North American society routinely kept skulls on their desks or on their bookshelves um, with the inscription, Memento Mori, remember that you're going to die. There was not considered gross or repugnant to have a skull sitting opposite you on your desk as a constant reminder that that's what lies in store. So uh, that's one possibility. In uh, Japan and Korea today, North, uh, South Korea, they have what they call um, coffin cafes. They're establishments where you can go and lie in a coffin for half an hour or an hour to get used to the thought that that's where you're going to end up. Those are two sort of ex ways of externalizing the experience of death. But of course, the primary struggle or, or exercise is internal is just mentally imagining your own death or yourself as a corpse or yourself in a coffin, spending the rest of time underground. You know, these are thoughts that most of us don't entertain on a daily basis, but that's what Seneca wants us to do. And how do we do that? Is it just a matter of meditating on it? I mean, do we decide that at two o'clock on Tuesdays and Thursdays that we should sit and, and think about that? I suppose one could schedule it uh, I or simply reading about other people's thoughts on death and dying. Reading Seneca would be another way to uh, to achieve the same ends. Yeah, I suppose having a routine, just like an exercise routine, where a certain portion of the week is devoted to that, that would be one way to achieve what, what Seneca wants us to achieve. Is there a risk in doing that, that a kind of depression or concern would build, as opposed to we would want the thing to be that almost as though we get desensitized to our own deaths, and thereby it becomes easier to accept. But for some people, I imagine that might exacerbate fear of death. Do you think that that might be true? Well, if, if that were to happen, I think Seneca would say, then you're doing it wrong. Uh, <laughs> you know, you're, you're looking at death in the wrong way. To look at it as a rite of passage, similar to birth, marriage, and coming of age, to look at it as a return to non-existence, the same state you were in before birth, to look at it as joining up with the cosmos in that your particles, the physical remains of your body will become part of the universe. Those are the ways that death should really be seen. And if seen in that way, it, it shouldn't inspire fear or depression. I know that something that helped me work through it was imagining how I would be treated after death. I myself am an atheist, so there is no afterlife or rejoining the cosmic conscious void or anything. I don't believe in that stuff. Uh, but I found a company, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but essentially you are cremated and put into an urn, which is buried and grows into a tree. And I thought, oh, what an amazing thing to actually look forward to as opposed to be afraid of. I could be a place where lovers meet in the park, or I could be a place where families have picnics underneath. And how interesting might that be? I might look forward to getting to something like that. So that that, that shifted my perspective, was thinking about the the how or the why or the the form that the death came in, you know, after the fact, what happened afterwards that, that made it easier for me to think about? 
Yes, that's right. And in my own backyard, we have a tree which has my great uncle's ashes incorporated into the the root system so that it nourishes the tree. Uh, That was my mom's request that some of his ashes go there. And we call it my Uncle High's tree, you know, uh, that that's exactly the kind of afterlife that Seneca wants us to imagine, that we're going to become part of a greater whole. We're going to contribute to the the growth of the world and uh, increase of the universe. So then we are perhaps using death as a way of understanding that we have a limited amount of time to be useful, to have utility, to frolic in the tulip, so to speak. And that's a great motivation to not waste our time. But at the same time, we're also seeing death as an opportunity to continue our utility. We are becoming, you know, to put it in Lion King terms, the circle of life, right? We become the grass that the cows graze on or something. And maybe that is, it's a different motivation, but it's a motivation just as good as the living motivation. Exactly. I think that's a very, very Senecan way of looking at it. You were not always a reader of Seneca. At some point, you were a younger person who probably feared death the way that anybody else does. Was there some big event in your life that changed this? Do you remember there being a day of this shifting, uh, or did it come gradually and intentionally? I would say that it really came out of reading Seneca. Uh, I think, for me, he's had exactly the effect that he wanted to have, that he allowed me to channel his thoughts and therefore to uh you know think of death in the in the way that he did so um yeah reading works of philosophy is the best medicine that's actually his foremost message in the essay on the shortness of life the one i've just translated as how to have a life that ultimately reading philosophy is a kind of cheating of death. It's a kind of immortality because your mind ranges through the ages back to Socrates and you, is in, in a sense, you inhabit all of time. So that's a kind of way of, of being immortal. So then I guess we could say if dying well isn't just you know, being prepared for death, it's also having utility afterwards. We could say uh, that Seneca, in fact, did at least partially, die pretty well. I think he would have been satisfied with his own death, that he showed the kind of commitment and and fortitude that he admired in others. So other than your own books, let's start with the classics, I guess. What works of Seneca in particular would you suggest that my listeners start with? The Letters to Seneca, I think, is the most well-known of his body of work, but there's also quite a lot in there that I wouldn't think that most people would get a lot out of. You'd have to kind of pick and choose, and maybe not everybody knows how to do that. So are there some selections of his work that you would suggest? Yes, very much so. Uh, My own volume for uh, Princeton University Press entitled How to Die, An Ancient Guide to the End of Life, uh, is selections from all of Seneca's works that deal with death. He never wrote a single essay about death. He had diversions and digressions in all of his written works where he contemplated the topic for just a paragraph or two, but then moved on to other themes. So I've extracted those paragraphs and packaged them in the volume called How to Die. And I've got three other volumes from the same series. It's called the Ancient Wisdom for Modern Readers series. It's a marvelous series by Princeton University Press, incorporating not just Stoic thought, but lots of different philosophies. There are four volumes on Seneca. And as I say, the most recent one is just coming out next week, How to Have a Life. Yeah, I'm interested in How to Have a Life because it isn't exactly the opposite of what we've been talking about. It is, in fact, in direct alignment with what we've been talking about. So where can people find that? Is that on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, wherever they get things? Yes, should be on both those places. And uh, I'm hoping it'll be in bookstores. A lot of bookstores have this series on their shelves, so you can browse other volumes in the series. They range very widely. Some of them are very specific, practical topics like how to drink, (laughs) and uh, others are um, of a broader moral philosophy nature, like how to be content or how to be free, and the ones from Seneca. If you're in a, a good bookstore or sometimes a museum bookshop, you can find some of these volumes displayed. 
I'm actually a fan of the Oxford series on mythology and folklore. I probably have 30 of them. So I like the kinds of volumes you're talking about. They're short. They're usually less than 100 pages, paperback, easy to digest, lots of great ideas in them. Exactly. That's what the Princeton series is designed for. It's uh, a way to make ancient philosophy less intimidating. It has these attractive titles that all start with how to. So they're sort of like user's manuals, user's manuals for the soul. Dare I say philosophy for dummies? <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't go that far because it is, <laughs> they are the original texts, but they're, they're texts, uh, uh, ancient texts that are packaged in a way that makes them more accessible. As you were saying about Seneca, his letters to Lucilius, his magnum opus is a vast work. Uh, nobody today reads it in its entirety. And even to read a substantial portion of it would be laborious. He goes on rather too long on, on some occasions and covers a huge array of topics. So the kind of volumes that Princeton publishes are packages, are, are nice little discrete packages that cover specific themes. Well, I know that by the time this episode airs, your book will be available and your other books, of course, already are. So I'll be sure to link all of those in the show notes of this episode. Be sure to check it. And James, again, thank you for spending this time with me. I hope that it has been enjoyable for you. I know it's been elucidating for the listeners. It has been enjoyable. Thank you so much for having me on. I hope you enjoyed that discussion. I will remind you again that there are links to James's books in the show notes, and I want you to go and check them out. They are really very terrific. And also, I think the best part of that interview came right at the end when James reminded us that philosophy is almost like a cheating of death, which is what Seneca thought of it as. It's a way for you to go back and see the wise minds of the past, be they Greek minds, Roman minds, Arabic minds, from wherever. Philosophers existed all over the world, so Greek philosophy doesn't have you know, ownership of all philosophies that could be considered or certainly have useful things to say. We can go back and we can read the words of these people who dedicated their entire lives in many cases to the pursuit of examining life and figuring it out. And by doing that, we can shortcut some of our own discoveries, some of our own pathways to solutions that make our lives more worth living than we think they are when we start our journey. So again, I hope you enjoyed my discussion with James Rahm of Bard College. And just a small correction, because at the outset of this episode, I said he was a professor of philosophy, which I guess is technically true. He is a professor. He is a philosopher. He does philosophize about philosophy. So in my eyes, he is a professor of philosophy. But specifically at Bard College, he is a professor of classics and also the director of the classical studies program. So you can learn more about him at Bard by visiting the Bard link in the show notes of this episode. And if you don't mind, I'd like to round this episode out by asking you for a favor. These interviews are still very new to the weekly schedule of Practical Stoicism, and I would like to know how you're enjoying them. And in particular, if you have philosophers that you think I should talk to and have on this show, why don't you tell me who those people are? And they don't have to be philosophers properly. They can just be interesting people because I have a whole list of folks, but you may have people on your list that I've never heard of and who I should know about. And so if you have people you think would do well on this program that others would want to learn about and hear from, send me an email, tanner at tannerhelps.com and let me know. I would really appreciate that. And with that, I will say thank you for listening. I appreciate you being here as always. And until next time, enjoy the rest of your week and take care. Take care.